You're listening to Men of Abundance, episode 144, with Christian Picciolini. Hey, I got it right. And today, we're talking about hate, more specifically, life after hate. Welcome to Men of Abundance, the podcast for those looking to level up their lives by hanging out with some of the greatest leaders and established professionals in our community, living a life of integrity, honor, and the abundance mentality. Prepare to pay it forward with your host, former army medic turned lifestyle entrepreneur, Wally Carmichael. What is going on, all of you amazing, abundant leaders out there? I am Wally Carmichael, your host and founder of the Men of Abundance podcast, the Pay It Forward community. Today's conversation, man, we go deep. And this one is kind of personal because this subject really does touch some of my very, very earliest life. Uh, Growing up with around bikers, around specific individuals who, quite frankly, live this lifestyle. And I'm not going to get that deep into my personal life. Just know that this is a difficult subject for me, uh, but I am willing to talk about it. In fact, I will tell you that later in my military career, when I went on to be an equal opportunity advisor, some of the people that I grew up with were like, you're doing what? (laughs) Do they know your background? And um, well, let's just say uh, people do change. And that is the conversation that I have with Christian today. It is, like I said, a very deep conversation, very thought-provoking, and I'll let you listen to the conversation before I get into my thoughts on this, and as you know, at the end of most every show, I always share my thoughts, and I will certainly do that at the end of the show today, and also share it a little bit in the show notes at menofabundance.com. Now, if you're brand new to Men of Abundance, I want to personally welcome you and thank you for being here. And I would like for you to go back and thank whoever it is that turned you on to Men of Abundance. And if you're a man, I would love to have you in our Men of Abundance community. Just go to menofabundance.com forward slash members or click on the members only tab at the top of any one of the pages at menofabundance.com. Get access so you can get in on this conversation because some of my guests are in there as well, and you can have specific conversations with them in reference to some of these issues and some of these conversations that we have on the show. And of course, I would love to humbly ask for you to take just a few minutes to go to menofabundance.com underneath any one of the podcast shows. There's a podcast player where you can listen to the show. Click on the iTunes or click on the Android Number one, subscribe to either one of those podcast players, whichever one it is that you use to listen to the show, and leave a rating and review. This small act of abundance and paying it forward pays huge dividends in iTunes searches and basically anybody searching for abundance and other men looking to live a life of abundance. Here's just one of the latest five-star reviews on iTunes. It's by Nicole Jensen. The title is Inspiring and Mind Expanding. Really enjoying listening to Wally and his inspiring guests. Love the format, stimulating questions, and valuable tips and habits. Truly inspiring and mind-expanding. Keep up the great work, Wally. I truly appreciate that, Nicole, and I appreciate anybody else who has left a five-star review. Chances are I've read yours on the podcast at one point in time because I have read every single one of them at this point. Again, I would love to hear your feedback, not just because it boosts us up in the searches on iTunes, but also because I truly want to hear your feedback. All right, now it's time for me to introduce you to our feature guest. Christian Christian Picciolini is an Emmy Award winning television producer, a prolific public speaker, a published author, and a reformed extremist. His work and life purpose are born of an ongoing and profound need to atone for his grisly past and to make something of his time on this planet by contributing to the greater good. After leaving the far-right hate movement he was part of during his youth, he began the painstaking process of rebuilding his life. Christian earned a degree in international relations from DePaul University, began his own global entertainment media firm, and was appointed a member of the Chicago Grammy Rock Music Committee and board member for the Chicago International Movies and Music Festival. In 2016, Christian won an Emmy Award for directing and producing Exit USA's There Is Life After Hate PSA and has been nominated for four regional Emmy Awards. He is an appointed United Nations affiliate ambassador for I Change Nations, 
and was honored with a National Statesman Award. Christian is an associate for the USC Price Homegrown Violent Extremist Program and has worked as an adjunct professor at the college level. He contributed to Google Chairman Eric Schmidt's and Jared Cohen's New York Times bestseller, The New Digital Age. Most notably, in 2009, he co-founded Life After Hate, a nonprofit helping people disengage from hate and violent extremism. In 2015, he published his memoirs, Romantic Violence, Memoirs of an American Skinhead. Men of Abundance, it is my honor to introduce you to Christian Picciolini. Christian, welcome to Men of Abundance, man. How you doing? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me on. Oh, seriously, my pleasure. And we're yet to see where this conversation is going to go. I'm pretty excited about this because I've got a background in some of what you do on a, on a different end of it. But we'll get into that. Where are you at in the world today? I am uh, very rarely I am at home and I happen to be home right now in, in Chicago. Oh, good for you. It's good to be home. It is good to be home. <laughs> I have not been to Chicago. I've got some friends from Chicago, and I have not been down around those parts yet, but I do plan on getting down there and or around there and checking out the, the scenery and the area and stuff. You know, it's a beautiful part of the country. It's, uh, you know, we've got great architecture and great lake and and uh, good food and, and amazing museums and culture. It's a, it's a great place to visit. You should come down sometime. Yeah, absolutely. Up, Def- up. Definitely we'll check it out. Yeah. Cool. So before we get too much into the show, I really like to start out the show pretty much the way I start out every single morning, which is with an attitude of gratitude. What do you have to be grateful for today, Christian? You know, I'm actually really grateful for my good friend, Tim Russin, who came over to my house today and helped me finish connecting up my podcast studio. So that's why you get to hear me nice and crystal clear today, because uh, he came over this morning, and I'm very grateful for that. That's awesome, and you do sound great. Thank you. Yeah, very good. That's that's all due to Tim Russin. Very Best good. engineer I've ever worked with ever in my life, and I've been in the music business for 20 years, and uh, he's an amazing uh, engineer. Well, that's impressive. So, yeah, at the end of this one, um, if you got any <clears throat> any links or anything like that, let me know. I'll make sure I'll plug them in the uh, show notes. Great. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, before we got started here, I talked a little bit in the intro about what you're doing, what you've been up to, and my goodness, you have one hell of a background. You've taken it to a level that most really just wouldn't even consider, and I thank you for that. I really do. Um, But here on Men of Abundance, we like to get to know the person and the man behind the abundance. So if you would, tell us a little bit more about yourself that maybe the average person doesn't really get to hear very much from you, and let's get a little bit personal. Sure. Well, uh, you know, aside from running the nonprofit, uh, uh, which we help people disengage from uh, violent extremist groups on a more personal level, I'm a father. Uh, I've got two amazing uh, young men uh, that are my sons uh, who could make me more proud every day. Uh, as they grow, my wife Britton, uh, gosh, I couldn't do anything. I think with, without her, uh, she is she's my rock. She's my logic. She is uh, she is definitely my better half. Um, and I, you know, I'm fortunate enough to love what I do. Uh, and I wake up every morning um, trying to uh, figure out how to help people, and and that for me is really uh, very fulfilling because. Uh, You know, most of my life, um, I felt uh, as though I was angry at the world. And uh, I've realized, you know, over the last years that, you know, I want to help the world. I want I want to help people not go down the same path that I did and, and, you know, and share the knowledge that I have on this path that I've taken uh, with other people who might be lost like I was. Yeah, yeah. I really felt that through your bio and reading through what you've done and getting to know you a little bit, uh, you know, through your social media and stuff that you've got going on and, you know, just seeing what you've done and then you've got the nonprofit, you mentioned it, uh, life after hate. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and how did, where did that come from? How did that really, um, come about? And by doing that, I would, I, I kind of want you to go into where you were at in your life sure. and how did it evolve into life after hate and then ultimately kind of rolling into your memoirs that you've got romantic violence memoirs of an american skinhead and then we're going to talk a little bit more about that sure so uh life after hate uh was i co-founded it in 2009 
um, basically as a way for uh, me and my business partner to tell our stories because we had never really been able to uh, to share our stories of what we had gone through. You know, me personally from the time I was 14 years old until I was 22 from 1987 to 1995, I was a member of America's first neo-Nazi skinhead group uh, based right here in Chicago. And, um, you know, I've spent the last 22 years uh, searching again after I left that and trying to find myself and who I really was this time. Uh, and it led uh, it led me to my business partner who, uh, you know, was going through the same thing. And we said, you know what, we need to start telling our stories. We need to start talking about how we changed and what transformed us so that other people that were like us can benefit from that. So it, it started off with this idea of putting, you know, it out there in the ether uh, and seeing what happened. And, and what we found out was that a lot of people... Uh, who thought that they were the only ones on earth that were going through that, the same thing that we went through, uh, now wanted to share their stories as well. We've since pivoted in 2011. We became a nonprofit. And uh, now we've, we've taken uh, the knowledge and our experience of being in these uh, extremist groups um, and helping other people now disengage from those same hate hateful ideologies and hate groups. Uh, and uh, we've been going strong uh, now for nearly a decade, uh, completely bootstrapped uh, on our own. Uh, and uh, we've uh, built a network of over 100 people that we've brought together after they've left that, that hateful life behind. Interesting. So how is that message being received? Oh, it's, uh, you know, it's certainly... Uh, it's overwhelmingly positive. Uh, you know, we, we certainly have our detractors who, uh, you know, are, are typically the people who are in that type of a movement. Um, but we, uh, I think we've provided a tremendous service to hundreds of people who, uh, you know, are either searching for help for themselves or maybe searching for help for a loved one or somebody that they care about. Uh, and uh, helped steer them on to the right path and then provided a support network for them of people that were just like them. Uh, and it's been, uh, it's been uh, an overwhelming success and, and, and hugely positive uh, results so far. That's really good to hear. It really is. Back in the, um, let's see, uh, early 2000s, actually, it was 2001. Was it? No, it wasn't. It was 2004. Uh, I was at active duty army, and I had the opportunity to go to the military's equal opportunity advisors course. And while in mm -hmm. that course, in that three almost four month course, and uh, we were introduced, we had a guest speaker come, and I, for the life of me, I can't remember his name. And I just thought about this actually. I was thinking about it when I first was introduced to you, and I can't remember his name, but he's a very well known. Um, speaker who was same situation, former skinhead. He told some amazing, just horrendous stories. And was his name T.J. Layden? T.J. Yes, yes. T.J. is a, a great friend of mine. He's an amazing individual uh, who was really one, of the, if not the first, to come out and talk about his story. Unfortunately, he's going through some health issues now oh. uh, that's limited his, his capacity to, to be able to go out and speak and tell that story. But uh, I urge people to go out and, and look at YouTube videos for T.J. Layden and and, uh, and hear his story. He's an yeah. amazing individual. I, I do too, definitely. And, he, you know, he told his story about when he was sitting down watching TV, a cartoon with his kids, and one of his boys stood up and said something derogatory. And he was like, wow, that's where my kids are going to be when they're my age. And that's when it was kind of his aha moment. And he had to make that change. What was that moment for you that really made you want to realize what you were doing wasn't healthy for you and made you want to first really just get out of the uh, environment? You know, it, it was a lot of those those kind of aha moments, those magic moments. Um, and it started with the birth of my ch my first child, my mm -hmm. son, and, you know, holding him in the delivery room and, and suddenly reconnecting with the innocence that I lost at 14 years old. But but the real the real point of transformation for me, uh, you know, came around 1994 uh, when I opened a record store uh, in Chicago because I wanted to sell this white power music that uh, I was importing from Europe. Um, and I opened a small shop uh, and uh, it, that music became 75% of my gross sales. 
and uh, you know, because I wanted to be an entrepreneur and I wanted to not just take money from you know my friends, I, I thought, well, I'll, I'm going to sell hip hop and I'm going to sell punk rock and heavy metal. And and uh, what happened next, I never really could have imagined. Uh, you know, the people that came in to buy that music, they knew who I was and uh, who you know who I had been for the last eight years, and they were African American and they were gay and they were Jewish, but. Instead of breaking my windows or attacking me or threatening me, uh, they came in uh, with compassion for me and with empathy. Uh, and it was, in fact, the compassion and empathy that they saw in me from the people that I least deserved it from, when I least deserved it, that really uh, forced me to, to humanize them and, and see that what I was doing was completely wrong. Mm. Yeah, that's um, I refer to that as divine intervention and a significant emotional event, I would think, on your part, because it was kind of confusing to you that these are the people that I'm trained and, and have learned to hate uh, in such exactly. a terrible way. And this is contrary to what I was taught to believe. Yeah, well, you see, you know, most people that I knew in that movement um, never, ever had a meaningful interaction with the people that they thought they hated. I certainly didn't. Uh, you know, and, and it was easy to dehumanize people or to make, make them seem like monsters or parasites or garbage if you didn't know them. Uh, and I always say that hatred is, is born of ignorance. Fear is its father and isolation is its mother. When we're so mm. afraid of something because we don't understand it right. uh, and we're so detached from them that we never get the opportunity to understand it, uh, sometimes we rationalize our own, um, you know, biases, uh, by pointing the finger at the other person, simply because it's easier than looking internally to see if perhaps we're the cause of those problems. Wow, yeah, fear is its father and isolation is its mother. I had never heard that, but that is, wow, that gives me chills because that is so <laughs> absolutely correct. And um, I can think of many remedies for that. But before we get into that, I would like to, I'm sure you've got quite a few um, kick in the gut moments along your path. I would love for you to share with us one of those kick in the gut moments to really Take us to a, a point in life that you really felt down to your knees, kicked in the gut, and really didn't feel like you'd be able to recover, but obviously you have. Yeah, um, there, there is one moment in particular that uh, I've still never been able to shake even after, you know, 25 years um, and, and it occurred one night in, in the early 90s uh, when some friends of mine and I, skinheads of course, were out drinking late one night. And, um, you know, we had walked into a McDonald's uh, and uh, there were three young black teenagers uh, in line. And when we walked in, I, I, you know, I yelled, this is my McDonald's, get out. And of course they ran uh, and we chased after them. And uh, when we were crossing the street or running at, you know, after them as we were crossing the street, uh, one of the, the black teenagers pulled out a gun and started to fire at us. And uh, didn't hit any of us, but the gun jammed. And uh, we caught this individual, this young man. And uh, we proceeded to beat him uh, very, very badly. And it was at one point, uh, and this is, uh, you know, one of those moments of clarity that I had uh, along the way. Where as I was uh, kicking him while he was on the ground, I looked into his eyes and for a moment he opened them and we connected and I felt empathy for him. I felt as though he could have been my brother or my father or my mother. It could have easily have been one of them. And uh, that feeling that overcame me and how I would have felt had it been one of them suddenly made me think of how that might make him and his loved ones feel um and uh that was really the last time I, I committed an act of violence and i don't know what it was specifically about that moment um but uh you know uh, it was a very awakening enlightening moment for me i didn't know how to understand it at the time but it was something that uh, definitely made an impact on me well wow. yeah i can definitely for definitely feel that so what was next what was next in your life how did that progress in your mind 
<clears throat> you know, it was a lot of questioning along the way. A lot of, you know, those eight years, even though I was very uh, passionate about what I was doing and I was, you know, a respected leader within the movement and I had built this persona because I had been in bands that, you know, were the first to travel, uh, outside, you know, outside of the United States to play. And, um, you know, but I always had these questions of, is what I'm doing, does it make me feel right or does it make me feel good or is it right or is it good? Uh, this, you know, this moral dilemma, this internal struggle. Uh, and I, I'm glad that those situations rose and I'm glad that people who I hated, uh, you know, found it in them to engage me in a dialogue that was meaningful because it's those moments, not the times when I was, you know, spit at or punched or had my tires slashed that changed me. Those are the times that made me angrier and wanted me to come back, you know, and fight even harder for what I was doing. Uh, but it was the moments when I received that compassion from the people that I least deserved it from, uh, when I least deserved it, that really had a, a huge impact on me. And it, and it was those progressive moments along the way uh, where I began to slowly pull out. Uh, and when I did, it was too late. Uh, because my wife and my children had left me by that point because I just hadn't left quickly enough. Mm. I didn't have a great relationship with my parents, even though they tried very, very hard. Um, you know, when I left the movement, uh, eventually in 1995, uh, when I was 22, I had lost my wife and my kids. I'd lost my business because I closed the record store when I decided to pull the white power music because I was so embarrassed to sell it in front of these new uh, friends and people that I respected. Um, and I lost my family because, uh, the one that I had built around me that had become my community, I, I left. So I went through a period of, of really, um, deep confusion and loss of hope, even more so than the loss of hope that caused me to go down that path to begin with. Um, because I had tried to outrun who I was. I was too embarrassed to talk about it. I tried to move. I tried to, you know, wear long sleeves to cover my tattoos. And, and I didn't talk about my past. Um, and uh, when I finally decided to, uh, because I was urged to by somebody who I had hurt in the past, um, it kind of changed my life because I had now started to explain that I used to be this person and the people I was telling just couldn't believe that who I was describing was the, was the person that they knew. Uh, and that was, you know, refreshing uh, that I was actually able to start to forgive myself and seek forgiveness for the things that I had done. And that's really what uh, led me down the path that I'm on today, which is, you know, to make sure I take that message out to other folks so that they, uh, if they're stuck, they can get out. And, and, you know, if they're teetering on the edge of going in, they, they decide not to because it really is um, just a it's it's just misery waiting to happen with no possible uh, positive outcome. Uh, so that has been the path. Yeah, and I'm glad you're sharing that. Um, man, I just want you to understand and want you to listen to what he said. And one of the things that I really got out of everything that he said there, which was quite a bit and very chilling uh, for me anyway, is the good message, good dialogue, good actions um, will always prevail. You know, he said that the the slashing of the tires, yeah, it pissed him off, but that's not ultimately what where you ended up taking your message. And you ultimately turned your mess into your message. And now you're helping others get out of the movement. How is that working out? How I'd love for you to share any good news stories that you have as far as um, any young men who have, or women for that matter, because I know there's women in the movement as well, that how did they get into the movement? in most cases, or in many cases, I'm sure it varies, but what is the psychology and what is the thought process that gets them into the movement? And then what are you doing to help get them out of it? Sure. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's really very similar, even though this, the, the micro circumstances are different. Um, you know, the reason that people join any type of extremist movement, whether we're talking about, uh, you know, a neo-Nazi or a white nationalist group, or uh, even a leftist group, or even ISIS, or even a you know an inner city gang, let's say, and it's three really fundamental human needs, and that is not ideology. They're identity, community, and a sense of purpose. Those are three things that every person on earth searches for at some point, almost always at the same time. 
you know, who am I? Where do I belong? Who's my tribe? Who are my people? You know, where where will I be accepted? And wh- how can I change the world? Those are the three questions we all ask. And uh, if there is uh, something broken underneath that or some sort of a perceived grievance uh, or a pothole, I call them potholes because they're the things that deviated us from our intended path. And those things can be things like trauma or abuse or addiction or poverty or lack of employment or lack of education um, uh, or mental illness. Uh, In my case, it was abandonment. I felt abandoned by my parents at a very young age. Um, And... um, because those things were existed under that search for identity, community, and purpose, and because I had been marginalized from my whole youth, uh, when somebody presented me the opportunity to be powerful and to be included and to belong to something, when I felt the most powerless and excluded uh, at 14 years old, I jumped at that opportunity, not even paying attention to the politics of it because I was 14. I didn't know anything about, you know, race or politics or, or, you know, uh, you know, identity politics, even, I, I, you know, it was, I, I was still trading baseball cards or trying to trade baseball cards at that point, but I didn't belong anywhere. And, and this man who happened to be America's first neo-Nazi skinhead leader, uh, his name was Clark Martell. He found me in an alley one day when I was smoking a joint, and he walked up to me and he pulled that joint out of my mouth and he said, "Don't you know that that's what the communists and the Jews want you to do to keep you docile?" I didn't know what a communist was. I didn't know what a Jew was. I didn't know, you know, what the word docile meant. But this this man paid attention to me, and he brought me into his world, and he gave me friends, and he gave me power when I felt the most powerless, and I completely overlooked what it took to get to those places, um, because what was more important to me than anything else was belonging and finding a place. What I do now to to help other people uh, is I do the same thing that happened to me. Is you know, first of all, I treat them in a very compassionate way, even though I don't agree with what they believe or how they go about it. Um, you know, I certainly understand where they come from because I was that person at one point in my life. Uh, so I, I listen and I listen for those potholes. And what I do when I identify what they are is I, I start filling them. Uh, I will find them, you know, an education uh, provider or I'll find them a, a life coach or a mental health professional or therapist or, or even a job sometimes. And it could be tattoo removal. It could be a million different things. And I work on the, on the person, I work on the human, uh, and to make that person more resilient. I don't argue ideologically with them and tell them that they're wrong, uh, because again, that'll just make us, uh, you know, uh, divide further and angrier. Um, and it's pretty amazing what happens, uh, Wallace, when, when the person becomes more resilient, uh, the need to blame the other for problems uh, lessens more and more. Uh, because now they're equipped, they're more confident, they're more resilient. The way I do challenge uh, the ideological narrative uh, is not by addressing it and telling them they're wrong. It's it's by introducing them to people that they think that they hate. I may bring uh, a Holocaust denier to meet with a Holocaust survivor or uh, an Islamophobe uh, to meet with an imam or to have dinner with a Muslim family or uh, – somebody who is a homophobe to meet with uh, or, you know, have lunch with uh, a a gay couple. And, you know, like I said earlier, most times these people who hate uh, have never had a meaningful interaction or dialogue with those people that they hate. So this is the first time and suddenly they get the opportunity to humanize them and understand that we have many, many more similarities than we have differences and that the differences are really to be appreciated because that's what makes us unique. Uh, and that's what adds all the color to our world uh, with art, and music, and you know, tradition and, and culture. Um, and, um, and then afterwards, you know, it's very important that when you take people out of a community to put them in a new, you put them in a new one. So we provide a support network of over 100 people that we've helped that, are, that are, were at some point just like them. Well, Christian, this conversation right here and everything you just said just completely and totally energizes me. I love diversity, and I love that you said you bring in all the different colors together. I've always, I've often heard this analogy over the years, uh, you know, the melting pot analogy, and I don't, I never like that melting pot analogy because that basically brings everybody together as one and makes us all one color. 
And right. I'm more of like the, if, you, if you're into analogies, guys, I'm, I like the pot of stew analogy in that you throw in your meat, your potatoes, your carrot, your spices, you know, all this other stuff. And it becomes something new, but you still can mm-hmm. identify the carrot, the meat, the potatoes, the celery. You can identify all of these other ingredients and they take I, on I the like flavor that. of each other. Yeah. I, I hope you don't mind if I use that in absolutely the future. Not. I, really, I love that analogy. Yeah, absolutely not. Just um, give me credit twice and then it's yours. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. You got it. But I mean, seriously, you know, it's, it's, I grew up, I grew up in a, my high school was 10% Caucasian. If uh-huh. you've ever seen the movie Spare Parts with George Lopez, that's the high school I graduated from, Carl Hayden High oh, okay. School. Yeah, okay. and um, good movie, by the way. And, you know, so I grew up, you know, in a is predominantly Hispanic, and I thought I was, I just knew I couldn't be there, stay there, because I just really enjoyed meeting other people. And even years ago, when somebody, I was always open to try new things, so... It just energizes me to be in an environment where people can get along. Now, I can't say we always got along growing up in high school. I got into a lot of fights because of the, you know, the long blonde hair and the Hispanic, you know, little gang members and stuff going around. But we had our differences. But most of the time we were fighting over stupid things like, you know, my rock and roll is better than your rap music type of thing. It's just ridiculous, you know. Right. Yeah, and you know, that's just part of growing up, right? I mean, yeah. I, th- I think we do need to change the, the culture of the way we're raising kids and really support them more and provide them with opportunity because I tell you what, you show me somebody without hope and I will show you somebody who will pick up a gun or be violent or go down a negative path, um, you know, and, uh, you know, we're not doing enough, I think, to support uh, the people who need it the most uh, and, and providing opportunity to, to young people. Uh, so that they f- so that they can pursue their passions and not have to search for them in negative places. What do you think that we can do if we're if we're not doing enough? And I do agree with you. Um, what thought process would you come up with? You know, it, it ranges from everything as simple as you know when your children uh, are born, start feeding them ethnic foods because maybe if they're not afraid to to eat Indian food or Japanese food or uh, African food, uh, maybe they won't be so afraid of those people. Um, you know, instead of feeding them grilled cheese sandwiches and chicken nuggets, to you know a more uh, a larger, more grand scale approach of building incubators, uh, micro incubators in underserved communities specific for community members to come in and try to start businesses to um, you know to create opportunity in in the places that really are underserved and, and, and seriously lacking um, I think that there's a lot we need to do uh, and I think we need to to you know, we have a lot of smart people who can pick these projects and actually run with them and, and make them happen you know it's so funny you say that and it just dawned on me when I was a very young man Um, we were super poor and we always occasionally you had these I think it was a church service going around and they were giving out ethnic food and in fact it was Indian food and they Mm -hmm. my dad my mom was like we're not gonna eat that crap you know and I'm like I'll eat it you know at that age because I always you know I just wanted to try it I loved it I ate up every bit of it and they wouldn't touch it and it's so funny because you, you brought up Indian food. And as a medic traveling around the world, everybody always said, hey, let, let Doc try it. He'll, he'll, he'll eat anything. And I would. <laughs> <laughs> I had an iron gut. But they nice. quickly learned that just because Doc will try it doesn't mean, and likes it doesn't mean that they will. Uh, so that right. is, that's interesting. And I agree with you. Just as simple as trying different ethnic foods is very important. And not like, you know, Mexican food isn't Taco Bell type of thing. You know, really go out and right. and embrace the uh, the culture in that. Exactly. Exactly. You know, if we keep – goes back to that, you know, isolation and fear thing. If we're so isolated from things and we never get the opportunity to enjoy them – um, and, uh, you know, we become afraid and, and that's just not, that's not fair to ourselves to do that to ourselves. Why would we want to limit our happiness? Why would we want to cut off our abundance to all this beautiful, uh, culture and history and storytelling and everything that's happened in the world in every corner of the globe? Why would we want to squander that abundance? Yeah. So amazing. We can go on and on with this conversation, Christian. I know I can for sure. Um, I don't know if you're, (laughs) I'm sure you're not tired of talking about it, but I I can just have these conversations forever. But we're at the point in the show where we're going to pay it forward to our abundant leaders. You ready to do that? Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. Outstanding. 
So give our abundant leaders one to three actionable steps that they can take today. I'll give them one step with three words. Make good happen. If it doesn't fit that criteria, don't do it. Oh, I love it. It's easy to remember. Yeah, I love it. What does that look like? You know, it, it's uh, from uh, staring at people's eyes instead of the pixels on your phone when you wa- you know are walking down the street to opening a door to, you know, maybe stopping and saying hello to somebody you wouldn't normally do or to go out of your way to volunteer in a place that make good happen. And if, if what you're about to do doesn't fit that criteria, maybe you shouldn't be doing it. Wonderful. I love it. Thanks for sharing that. What daily mm-hmm. habits make up the biggest impact in your life, Christian? I think for me, it's staying organized. Uh, You know, I've learned, uh, I used to be, and I still am to a degree, the kind of guy who is, you know, fly by the seat of his pants because that's exciting to me. Uh, But I've learned that I have to be organized. uh, And and that's not just to to keep me sane, but that's so I can serve uh, people more efficiently. Um, Eat healthy, run, uh, and um, love your family. Spend time with them. Good balance is important. It is, absolutely. So what are you reading or listening to now that you would recommend to our abundant leaders and why? Oh, good question. Uh, I am currently reading Tranny by Laura Jane Grace. It's a memoir by um, the singer of a punk band called Against Me who went through a transition recently. Uh, It's a pretty amazing book. As far as music, let's see. Right now I am listening to... Uh, two bands, um, one uh, called Foxy Shazam from Cincinnati, Ohio, and the other band is Portugal the Man from Wasilla, Alaska. Wasilla, Alaska. I'll have to check that out. I haven't, um, I don't, that's one thing I have to say that I really don't get a whole lot into is is really new types of music. Although my wife and I have un, uncannily recently been listening a lot to bluegrass. We just find it so mm. um, calming to just have it in the house or even when we're driving. I don't know where that came from. She started and she's from Panama. And we've been listening <laughs> wow. to bluegrass. I'm like, very interesting. <laughs> it's funny that you say that because literally a half hour before we started this po- this show here, my son came in and he came to pick up his camping equipment because he and his friends were going uh, for a couple of days to a bluegrass festival and they were camping out. So How awesome is that? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's interesting. Very interesting. So what do you feel holds most people back from truly living their life of abundance? Fear. Yeah. I think we are afraid. I think we're afraid of, of what success and failure looks like. Uh, and uh, we're afraid of each other, even though we don't know each other. And I think if we were just to let down our guard a little bit and make the, take the initiative to make you know that first step, we'll find out that there's really nothing to be afraid of. Mm. We're afraid of each other, even though we don't know each other. And that's what fear is, right? Fear is just, it's the unknown. You don't know what's right. on the other side. Right. Know? Absolutely. So what... What does living a life of abundance mean to you? You know, I think it goes back to to those three words, making good happen. It's, uh, you know, as long as as I'm leaving more positive footprint than than I'm taking, I think, than than I am living a life of abundance. So my my goal is to to leave more good in the world than than I've left bad behind. Absolutely. You know, we're going to have your website here linked up in the show notes. That's Christian... I'm gonna like try, a peach. Oh, uh, Pete, peachy, I'll oh, do it. You for got me, it. Man. Come on, baby. Come on. <laughs> Picciolini. Picciolini. It. Okay, I got it. Picciolini. I told you I wasn't <laughs> going to try to say it during the show. I was going to practice it first, but I appreciate that. And I'll have that linked up in the show notes at menofabundance.com. So, Christian, before we close up here, what would you like to ensure that our abundant leaders get out of our conversation that we didn't talk about already? You know, I think that that the most important thing that I've learned along the way and that I've helped other people realize is that people can change um, and uh, that sometimes we have to embrace the people that say the ugliest things for them to understand that those things that they're saying are wrong. Um, And uh, that, you know, love and compassion really are the most powerful tool against hate. Um, Yeah, I think that that's what it comes down to. Yeah, no, thanks for that. It really does. It it it, it really is that simple. It, it and if we just practice it more often, it can make a huge difference. So, 
how can anybody else other than your website how can anybody else reach you or find out more about what you're doing get a hold of your memoirs and all that good stuff sure uh, you can find me on, on all the usual social media places like Twitter and Instagram and, and Facebook. Uh, you know, my website you'll have posted, but if they're interested in, in the nonprofit, that's lifeafterhate.org. Uh, and you can find my book, Romantic Violence, Memoirs of an American Skinhead, uh, on Amazon or at your local bookstore. Excellent. And again, I'll have all of that linked up in the show notes, guys. You don't have to worry about writing everything down. I'll have all of the social media there. Uh, you definitely want to get in and follow people and follow somebody like Christian because it, you know, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. You don't have to spend that time with them physically. Get them in your earbuds. Get them on your Twitter feeds. Whatever platform that you pay attention to, start changing up a little bit and get to know people that you don't normally know. And one more thing about this, and I'd like your thought process on this as well, Christian, before we close this up. Sure. is don't make your social media if you're if you're big on social media and I know some of you aren't but one way to really expand your mind is to do what you can to follow people you don't even have to friend them you can just follow people that don't look like you don't think like you don't act like you even people that you know for a fact do not you don't agree with how they think it will expand your thought process to at least be able to have an intelligent argument uh, if you choose to do so. Um, <laughs> but follow people that you wouldn't, that, that aren't like you. What are your thoughts on that, Christian? Yeah, I think that that's great. But I think more than that, if you are one of those, uh, you know, people uh, who might hate, uh, challenge yourself. If you think you're powerful and more superior, challenge yourself to actually get to know the people that that you hate so that you can speak uh, from a place of understanding. On the flip side, if you are one of the hated, if you are one of the marginalized, uh, don't feel so, uh, you know, to be yourself, go out there and, and, and make yourself known to the people that uh, you think may have opposing views and, and show them the true you. Uh, because uh, again, everybody I've known that's left this movement has said, you know, it's because I got to know the people that I hated. Well, that part, there's a whole different conversation, and I'm glad you brought that up, and we will get into that at another point in time. But today, Christian, we're going to close this up. I truly appreciate your time. Thank you very much for getting your message out and doing what you're doing to get people out of that hate mentality and out of that movement and any other movement like it. Uh, really, just thank you so much. Aloha. My pleasure, Doc. Aloha. All right, guys, I told you that was going to be a little bit deep. And before I get too much into my thoughts on this, I want to thank Kevin Henry for introducing Christian and I. Kevin is out here in Hawaii with me, but he's got a really cool Facebook community called the Diversity Community. He also has a weekly live call that you can get in on where they're talking about all the subjects around diversity. And he's in the process of putting a podcast together around the idea and the benefits of diversity. And as you may know, I am super energized with the whole idea of diversity like Christian and I were just talking about. I absolutely love when people from such drastically different backgrounds can come together for a common good and get along with each other. We can all have our differences, and we do have our differences, and that's the beautiful thing of it. That's like I was talking about in our conversation about the pot of stew. We are different, but we also have a lot of similarities. But even with those differences, you know any organization that is very well diverse and they have a lot of different thinkers, men, women, people from all different cultures, they are the best businesses out there on the planet because they got so many great ideas coming together and then they have great leadership who knows how to put all those ideas together and come out on the other end with an amazing product and service. Same thing with the families. Families that come together, even though they, they, even families, they don't get along all the time, but when they come together, it's just a beautiful thing. Look at the adversities of your country. Look at the United States when anything drastic, anything traumatic happens in the United States of America. All of us put all of our differences aside and we come together to help each other out. Why can't it be like that all the time? I mean, when it's not going to be Nirvana, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm just talking about living together, having a better chance to understand each other, and just taking the time to have that conversation. So I strongly encourage you to go back and listen to those action steps that Christian shared. Go out and meet somebody, get to know somebody, thank somebody who probably doesn't deserve your words, probably doesn't deserve your thanks. 
And just in case you're wondering, the reason why they may not deserve your thanks is because some way that they may have treated you or somebody who looks or acts like you. Thank them. Tell them, hey, I recognize you as a person, I recognize you as a human being, and I appreciate you. And walk away. That's it. Chances are it may not change them at that point in time, but it will at the very least plant a seed and say, that was different. That's not what I've expected from that type of person. Give it a try. Guys, make sure you share this episode with everybody. Share it on all of your social media. Just share it. And go out there and live your life of abundance. And make sure to pay it forward. That's all for today, Abundance Leaders. For more about our guests and the powerful information we shared with you today, be sure to sign up for our mailing list at menofabundance.com. We appreciate your time and look forward to hanging out with you on our next episode. So until then, be sure to pay it forward and live your life of abundance.